Have you ever watched a title chess player analyze a position and just say, oh, I mean, obviously black is just slightly better here. What on earth are they talking about and how do they know? In this video, I'm going to teach you the universally agreed upon four criteria to evaluate any chess position. Essentially, you must compare between white and black, the material, the king's safety, the activity of the pieces, and space advantage or pawn structure. Computers then analyze things in plus or minus, like plus one means that white is up one pawn of advantage, whereas minus one means the opposite. So we're going to take a look at five examples using this criteria, and then after that, I'm going to do one training position to work you through the thought process. Just remember that evaluating a chess position is just step one. After that, you have to find the correct plan, whether it's down the middle, on the king side, on the queen side, whether you're supposed to attack or whether you're supposed to defend. It's not always so simple. So let's begin with this game. I've got the white pieces here. This is from a Blitz game a couple days ago uh, against a uh, random international master with a Winnie the Pooh profile picture. And this is the result of the opening. So if we begin with king safety, right? Material is completely equal, king safety. I mean, it, it's very difficult to say ultimately. Uh, I would say that it's about balanced, uh, and, you know, to be honest, the black castles, it's not like I'm ever going to get in. But, then we start looking at peace activity and space. Peace activity generally means knights, bishops, rooks, and queen. And what that means is your future prospects of the knights and the bishop. It doesn't just mean where they're standing now if they're looking nice and pretty. It means how many squares do they control on the enemy side of the board. This bishop for black is terrible, but the other three pieces are actually very full of life. Maybe black will go here. Maybe black will activate the knight and target my pieces. My bishop is not really playing. This knight doesn't really have any future prospects. As nice as it is, it can just become a target. And this bishop just bites into granite. So my opponent has the advantage there. Then if we take a look at pawn structure, I mean, this is like very like strange by black, but black is very close to mobilizing. Whereas I got this dumb pawn. Maybe I'm going to do something on this side of the board, but it's actually my opponent who after I played knight d2, thinking I was activating my bishop, played a5 and I didn't even realize what that move was trying to do. And then they attacked my knight and then they trapped my bishop. So a few moves later, I just got a completely losing position. And if we plug it into the computer, like in this position, you say, okay, black is winning on these criteria. So what is the evaluation? Now, of course, computers need to go to a certain depth, okay, which is just the layer of analysis that they do. And all of that analysis is based on future prospects. That comes back now. And if you look, I mean, it says, you know, with best play, black is up about minus 0.8, which is a pretty substantial advantage. It's nowhere near winning, but black has clearly won the battle of the opening. And then obviously a few moves later, once it's, you know, quite clear I'm getting my bishop trapped, it, it goes to minus one, minus two, because I can win a pawn, but, you know, I'm still going to be down the bishop, which makes sense. For the rest of this video, I've actually selected other creators. So here we're taking a look at one of Hikaru's games uh, that he played with the black pieces against the Grandmaster from Guatemala. Now, if we take a look at this position, we start with material, it's equal. Uh, no one's up anything. How do I count that that fast? Very easy. Knight, knight, queen, queen, bishop, bishop, two rooks each, six pawns each. Now we say king safety. You know, the king is in a very unorthodox position here, but again, it's not just, oh, my king's out in the open, it's, can they even attack my king? Not really. Um, you can't move up because of en passant, right? I'm, I'm clamping down. Um, we start going to peace activity. This is a terrible piece. Also, this queen's not doing anything. You know, these rooks are nice. This is white's most active rook, right? But black's got what's called an outside protected pass pawn. That pawn will start to move up the board if you can kick out the defense. These pieces are very passive. This knight is good. It's pressuring in. Uh, this bishop has this whole diagonal. And all Hikaru has to do is move his queen and move over with his rook. And he's going to have a very nice position. So peace activity, he's winning. And in terms of space, I think it's about equal. You know, space is enemy squares that you control on the other you know, side of the board. Um, it's about, you know... There you go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, nine. For white, it's really this rook. Like, if you remove this rook, white has almost no space. So black is winning on a few criteria there. Let's take a look at the evaluation. And there you go, just like last game, it's about minus 0 0.6, minus 0 0.7. I mean, black is, is ever so slightly better, but let's see what Hikaru does. White slides over the queen, black slides the queen up, kind of monitoring this and trying to go here. And as you notice, he immediately trades off the rook. Like, he doesn't even wait. He just takes the rook. 
because now the queen and the rook are just kind of awkwardly positioned, and all of a sudden it's minus three, because after this move, the queen's got a very uncomfortable decision. Queen a6 was played in the game, but look at this. Hikaru uses the rook trade to attack the queen and infiltrate, and now black is almost winning because of just the degree of pressure that this rook is bringing. Even this pawn, uh, even though it's weak, cannot be taken because the queen has to maintain defense. Black played bishop to g1, Hikaru played bishop d8 safeguarding, um, and then, well, I mean, white went back and hung this, but apparently the best way to even win here is just to jump in with the knight. You say, why is that so good? What if just knight takes knight, then takes, and if you take me, I have check. And so I used my original kind of lead in position to trade off your most powerful piece, infiltrate by attacking your queen, and this game is over because of this beautiful tactical idea, queen f3. Now, imagine you get to this position in a game and then you offer a trade of rooks. Look what happens to the advantage. Right, so it's minus 10 or maiden 4 if and only if you see it. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? I don't know, let's not have a philosophical conversation. The point is that at the initial position um, after, you know, after uh, king to g7, Black is ever so slightly better because of these kind of few points. Okay, let's take a look now at this next game. I said I was going to take a look at a few creators games, right? So here's a game that Alexandra Botes played, I think a couple days ago on stream. Uh, she is playing with the black pieces against the 2100. Uh, we take a look at the material, completely equal. Queen, queen, rook, rook, bishop, bishop, knight, knight. Optically, optically, when you first look at this position, it looks very bad for black because this pawn is so good. You can't really move up. You're constantly worried about the back rank. Oh, the knight came here. Oh, 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 oh man, it's pro. Oh, my God. This is close. Oh, my, I'm going to get mated somehow. But then you, like, calm down for a second. You go, wait a minute. My bishop literally laser beams the entire board, okay? This knight is a target. Like, it's a target. And I'm going to go here. I'm just going to activate my rook. I control a lot more squares on their side of the board than they do on my side. This could be a liability for my opponent if I trade the pieces, and in the future I'll just go here and I'll take it. So let's take a look at the evaluation. Look at that. It's minus two if you spot bishop takes pawn, because takes, takes, takes. If and only if you spot that. There is a tactic. That is the wild card that I am now introducing in all of this. Positions can have big swings depending on a tactical shot. In fact, I cherry-picked this position because a move before white played knight to b5, this position was plus three if white had found knight f5. A, a glorious move because you hit the bishop. Now, if the bishop just moves like to g5, the knight comes in, you hit this, this, and now the computer evaluates this as just completely winning. Plus 11, white just attacks black, and, and that's it. And this is winning because you have one, two, three, four pieces going to go against one king and maybe a bishop. Like the bishop and the queen are disconnected and you don't have, your space advantage means nothing. You never got to activate your rook, okay? All of these criteria. King safety in this position is the most important thing. It's king safety. You trade material for the weakness of the king and now white has to find queen h4 and there's no way to guard this bishop. Look, if you wander the bishop out this way, I check you and I now use that against you. So I'm down a knight, but I'm destroying you in the category of king safety. And tactical shots kind of break this traditional, you know, e like ev evaluation mechanism because tactical shots disregard all that. They just go, you know, straight for the kill. You could make some sort of argument here that, well, you know, this move cares about king safety and sacrifices material, fair, but they're kind of the wild card element, right? Because in the game, white went here, black did this, now queen f2, and now c6. So Alexandra made a pawn break, took in the center, and then activated her bishop. So now she's got two very active bishops laser beaming the board. She, she defended her rook, and then she played this move, targeting the knight. The, the queen defends, now she plays c4. So in the span of a few moves, Alexandra's defended her king, she's activated all of her pieces, and like she, how many squares of space does she have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You know, white has also got some space, but it's nowhere near 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, right? So, but for white, it's like very difficult to move. You can't actually move this knight. So, and in a few moves, you know, white got a little bit wild. Look at that nice, nice little trick there. You can't take me because of the pin. Alexandra goes back. It's a little bit of a time trouble. She simplifies the position. She wins the pawn. And just a few moves later, she safeguards her king and she wins the game because her queen and bishop kind of live to tell the tale. Now, if we go back to knight to b5, black is a lot better here if black finds the tactic, which is that wild card element, right? There's these tactical shots. But overall, black is still better because even if black doesn't find that, by activating all of her pieces, Alexandra counterbalances the, the, the king safety issue, which definitely is legitimate, with massive peace activity, a massive space advantage, and long term, this pawn is actually just a weakness because the knights don't coordinate well on an open board against all of these laser beaming bishops. So with that said, let's take a look at the next game played by Daniel Naraditsky against Super Grandmaster Jan Yipomnici. This is, this is a great game. It's a great matchup. So Daniel has emerged from the opening. Nepo has just played bishop to d7, right? Material completely equal, as always. I don't want. I didn't want one of these to have some crazy evaluation or you know because of material. Now, king safety. Of course, it's white. I mean, white is castled. Black's king is in the center, and black cannot castle short. Black cannot castle short because rook takes. Black wants to go long. That's what black wants to do. In terms of peace activity, it. I mean, it's it's not a really a question. I mean, white's got a laser beaming bishop, a second one, the knight, and I mean, really, it's the rook. I mean, it's the rook, right? Now, even pawn structure is slightly better for white, ever so slightly, because white has something called a queenside pawn majority, which really doesn't matter much. At this level, it does. You know, cut the rating in half, it doesn't mean anything, but it just means that in all endgames, white is slightly better. So Daniel needs to do something, okay? Now, before we, we see what, you know, he can do, we take a look at the eval. Uh, it's no joke. I mean, white is about 1.3. That is up a pawn and almost half of another one but only if he finds the best move, and he finds it. He anticipates that black wants to castle long, and he plays knight g5. This is a beautiful move. It doesn't let black go long, because you're going to abandon the defense of this. And he also threatens h7. But he also threatens an even prettier move, and he finds it. The only way to keep that big advantage? To just jump in anyway, because the king is guarding the bishop. So if the king takes, you activate your rook with check and you win the pawn. Then you're going to target the knight, completely winning. So Daniel finds that wild card element, showing his class. Uh, Nepo goes here, now we get this, this, this. So with this transformation now, we get two bishops versus a very passive bishop and knight. White maintains that dominant advantage. Black has to go back and defend this. And watch as Daniel just continues to improve his position. Rook c8. He plays rook e1, bringing another rook to the game, and now c5, defending using his dark squared bishop, right? Bishop to c6. He avoids the trade. If you are dominating a player, you want to avoid the trades. It lets them get back into the game. And now he pins the pawn, he targets the weakness, and then he plays f4. He sees this, so he wants to play f4, f5, hitting it, oh, hitting it again. Nepo has to respond. Daniel activates the rook now to go for another weakness. Daniel... Ended up, uh, he, he ended up uh, winning the game uh, in very nice fashion. But again, none of that would have been possible if he didn't find knight g5. You know, if you play a calm move like rook e1, you're still going to be better. But then black is going to play f6, repelling you. And then if you play another move just being, you know, patient, black is going to castle. And the more moves you give to your opponent when you have the advantage, the faster they're going to consolidate. So you need to find something. In that last game, it was this beautiful knight to f5. In this game, it was this beautiful knight g5, knight f7. In that last game, it would have led to mate. In this game, it leads to something a little bit more, le less like rough than mate. It leads to a knight for bishop exchange, which leaves Daniel with the dominant bishop, just laser beaming both sides there. So that's kind of a much more advanced example. And then for our last example, we're going to take a look at one of a game uh, that Eric Rosen played. So I just went around all the creators, right? This is a game that he played against the creator, seemingly, creator from... Uh, I don't know if that person is from Timor Leste. If they are, that's incredible. I, but I believe this person is from Spain. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, okay. So we look at this position. What is the balance? It's equal because Black has Queen Queen Rook Rook. Black has a Rook for a Bishop and a Knight. Black has seven pawns. White has six. So Black has Rook and Pawn for Bishop Knight. Normally, Bishop and Knight are better. 
but it's all about your future prospects. We go to King Safety. Definitely Black is winning because, I mean, look at this. You got this targeting. This is going to come in and try to take. It's very bad. Peace Activity? I mean, it's to Black again because these, knight, these, these pieces aren't actually doing anything. This Bishop is, like, nice, but it has no threats. Black is going to go G6 and kick it out in a second. This Rook is passive. And then in space, it's, it's you know, I, I would say space is a little bit the same in this case. I think, you know, one, two, this bishop is actually pretty good. But it's, it's a useless piece just because it's about to get kicked out. So I think black is actually winning in three categories. The only thing the problem is, is that black's rook is a bit stuck. And if the queens get traded, the king's safety no longer matters. Does that make sense? The king is very weak. But only if the queen is on the board because you're actually threatening to mate. Without the queen, the king's safety matters less, especially as you go to an endgame. So here, black is better. And if we take a look at the evaluation, with the exception of one move for white, black is winning, actually. Black is minus two. The only move white has is to play knight e2. Do you know why that's the best move? You activate your garbage knight. You reroute your knight to this side of the board. That also allows you to bring your rook and potentially activate your queen. So one move, and it was played in the game. It was played in the game. Eric Rosen played rook e8, activating his, uh, his other rook, knight f4, and now his rook got really trapped, right? It got really trapped. So it would have been better for Eric to play like g6, kicking out the bishop, as you can see. And then, for example, if the bishop retreats to like d3, for example, now you have rook back and you've activated your rook once again. You have a big advantage and now this. But Eric played kind of just an improving move, got his rook chased around, and it led to, you know, a whole bunch of complications. See, now white is slightly better, but now white gives away advantage again because, because black can play g6. It's apparently the move there, g6. Black doesn't play g6. Now it's apparently plus one for white, and white plays rook e1. Nice little trick, because if take, take, and take, back rank mate. So it's that king safety element that comes back to hurt, and now if you come back and you guard your king... Well, your queen is, I mean, your rook is just trapped on the edge of the board. So peace activity suddenly completely flips to white. And that's why white has a plus two advantage because white goes here and dominates you. All of a sudden, white's got beautiful pieces and your pieces suck. So it's not that you're, it's like king safety doesn't matter anymore because it's, again, it's, it's like, oh, there's a weak space in front of my king, but no one can get to your king. See, in the original position, like if we go back some moves in the very original position after rook h3, there is a legitimate chance you are going to get mated in the next two moves. So, or three or four. But the point stands. By activating this knight and kicking out the rook and paralyzing it and then blockading, black gets a good position. Now, g6 still would have been a good move, but, you know, life goes on. And for this last one, ladies and gentlemen, um, I've actually done something very bold. I have um, selected one of my games, but I have not reviewed it. So I run the risk of looking like an idiot. This is one of my games. I played this game recently on stream. Uh, Chess.com shows my most recent blitz rating, but this was like from a week ago. Uh, and I picked a position that was deliberately very strange. And the point was to go through all of this criteria and, you know, either look like an idiot uh, or be correct. So, what is going on? This is the opening. It's currently move 15. And... We've traded a piece each. Now, black is up a pawn. So, one, two, actually, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, black is up a pawn, number one. King safety? It's about the, I mean, we both have very peculiar pawn structures, you know? I mean, so our kings are kind of weak, but also safe. My opponent cannot move their bishop because I target this. Check is not a threat because bishop f2. So it's about the same. So black is up a pawn. I would say that white is maybe a touch better because of, um, because of their, where their king is. But, you know, and then when I start thinking about future prospects, like the peace activity, you know, white's got more pieces out than me, but it's a very close position. So if I'm thinking about knight moves, I'm thinking there and there, uh, and then maybe knight to b3. If I'm thinking for my opponent, I'm thinking just bring the knight back, solidify the center, don't let me take that pawn, and then start pushing in. Like, really start pushing in. You get connect four here against my bishop, I'm going to go knight e7 as my next move, which I actually think I literally did that in the game. And then white ended up playing c5 and, you know, we had a very crazy game. White activated their bishop, whatever. If I had to give you who's better here, just based on space, 
I think that Black's extra pawn is counterbalanced by the fact, or Black, you know, White has what's called compensation in the form of a bit more safer king, a bit more clear future prospects. Because if White is able to play c5, d5, rook b1, like really apply pressure here, I think that White is, doesn't really care that they're down a pawn. Um, but if White is unable to do that, then I'll be able to consolidate and ultimately end up winning the game because I'll, I'll have the advantage in the end game. I'll, you know, drop my knight in here and whatever. If I have to give you a numerical number, I would say it's like, it's not minus one. So minus one, black is up a pawn, it would be minus one. I think it's like minus, I think black is actually doing pretty well. I would say it's like minus 0.75, okay? That's what I'm gonna say because I think white does have a little bit of counterbalance, but I think that black is okay. Uh, but this does look pretty scary. Again, if and only if white plays this. If white spends the rest of their game doing random garbage, it doesn't matter. Um, it, you know, black is going to win, but it, if and only if this happens, let's take a look. Oh, uh, oh, oh, I was, it was good at for, oh, now the computer, oh, computer's thinking, it's thinking, okay, it says 97's good, 97, okay, so I played one of the best moves, now white plays c5, which is bad if black, t what did I play? I played knight d7, okay, takes, takes, bishop b5. And, oh, and my opponent, my opponent just, <laughs> my opponent just blundered some pawns. Like I said, I didn't, I, I, I didn't prepare this one. This one I just wanted to see on the fly. Okay, so if not bishop b5, if my opponent here had played queen d2, defending the pawn before they made that blunder, yeah, see, white is back to equality. Like, I have to find this move. Like, look what happens if I just castle here. Lazy castling move. White takes, and all of a sudden, white's got activated this. So, the guy with the two bishops wants to open the board for the bishops. So if you go back a few moves, you'll notice, look at this, this is very solid. These bishops are blocked in. So white actually did a very good thing. White started trading off and then, well, white made a terrible blunder. But if white had kind of maintained that pressure, that advantage of minus 0.7 starts to go away because my pieces are very passive. And as the board begins to open up more like this and the queen laser beaming, as the board opens up more, the bishops become very powerful. The knight is now active. It wasn't active before. And for my temporary advantage of a pawn, white offsetting that with huge activity and then ultimately maybe even winning the pawn back will lead to white having that edge. So that is how you evaluate a game live action. Uh, of course, you know, the, the, the most difficult part about this, it's really a two-step process, is constant evaluation, constant. That's what's going on in our brains. The whole game, who's better? My plan is this, and then it's that finding a plan based on the evaluation. Then if you have four ideas, you have to evaluate all of those ideas before you decide whether they're good or bad. You have to go three, four moves deep and go, good, bad. Do it, don't do it. That is what chess players are thinking about more and more and faster and faster as they move up the rating ladder. So if you watch this and you're like, uh, I'm gonna go back and hang a queen on move nine, that's okay. I put this out there for the intermediate, the advanced players to kind of constantly have a, an understanding of what it is we're thinking about when we say black is slightly better. We're basing it on these four criteria and a little bit of those future prospects as well. For future videos, I am happy to cover concepts like this one. I'm always kind of brainstorming different things that I haven't covered yet on my YouTube channel. If you're new, welcome. If you've been watching for a while, welcome back. You're amazing. Thanks for making it this far in this video. Uh, let me know your comments. Uh, your thoughts in the comments below for other content like this one. If there's anything that you're confused about uh, chess-wise, I'll be glad to make that for you. So, I'll see you in the next video.